Zoom recording here. All right, so uh, good evening. Any questions about where we left off on Monday when we talked about uh, variances for direct materials and variances for direct labor? One thing I was a little bit shaky with was the um, the whole favorable and unfavorable. Like I thought I understood it, but then I was doing the homework and just wanted to clarify for the direct materials, is it you want the budgeted to be bigger than the actual? That's what will be favorable. I just wanted to recap that. Cause I, I wasn't- If the budget is more than the actual, then yes, that will be favorable. Okay. I'm, I can, can I say it, Lizo? If you spend less than what you plan for, that's a good thing. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you. You're welcome. In, uh, any other questions? All right, so let's um, skip that. So we're still talking about standard costs, right? And standard costs is what we use, what is what we use for budgeted purposes. And the standard cost that we want to achieve is finding that perfect balance between what can happen in an ideal world and what realistically is going to happen, right? And, and looking to find that that balance. So um, we talked about product costs, right? Consisting of direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing overhead. And manufacturing overhead is made up of three things, indirect materials, indirect labor, other manufacturing costs. And what we've been able to do all right, is we've learned, I believe it was chapter six or seven, how to take mixed cost and separate them out between fixed cost and variable cost. Okay. So we're going to create, uh, we're going to look at our overhead in terms of fixed overhead and variable overhead. So a recap, right, of how we get to overhead. If you recall, there's four steps to um, Allocating our variable, our allocating our you know overhead. To to happen, the period begins. Right. So during the budgeting process, this is when we're going to do step two and three, because we have to come up with an estimate of what our total year is going to be. Step two is we have to select an location base, select a cost driver. In this class, we really only used, uh, the textbook is only types of cost drivers. One has been uh, direct labor hours, one has been direct labor dollars, and one has been um, uh, machine hours. Uh, <clears throat> But that does not, there could be more uh, cost drivers, right? You just base it off of whatever you think the cost is or whatever you think is the best driving the overhead cost. Um, and then the third is we calculate our predetermined, in this case, variable manufacturing overhead rate by taking uh, one and dividing it by so then four steps we just talked about three on that fourth step 
this is happening as the um, as the year or the month is progressing. So on a daily basis, we're allocating portions of manufacturing overhead to each job based on that predetermined variable manufacturing overhead rate. Okay. And then we're um, we're, multi we're taking that rate and then multiplying it by um, the actual uh, the actual driver. So if we were talking about machine hours, the actual machine hours that we used on that job, we take that number, multiply it by our predetermined manufacturing overhead rate, and that's how much we would allocate of overhead we'd allocate to that job. Questions on that? <clears throat> so, so we can do an example here by looking at uh, Charlie Cycles. So let's assume that before the year started, they determined their total estimated variable manufacturing overhead cost is $20,160. And then let's assume that they selected as their cost driver uh, direct labor hours. And so then they have to estimate over this period of time how many direct labor hours they anticipate using. And in this example, it's 67,200. <clears throat> so in this example, to get our predetermined variable manufacturing overhead rate, we would divide 20,160 by 67,200. And when you do that math, that will give you 30 cents per direct labor hour. So you said you multiply the manufacturing overhead costs by the estimated allocation base? So this is step one, getting the 20,160. And this is step two, selecting an allocation base, direct labor hours, estimating that 67,200. And then step three is you divide this number by this number. Divide. Thank you. So 20,160 divided by 67,200 gives you 30 cents per direct labor hour. And if you recall, right, we're, we said that it takes four hours to, uh, four direct labor hours for a bicycle. So our budget is a dollar 20 per bicycle. Right, am I doing math right? 30 cents times four. Yeah. So our estimate, our, our budget is we're going to spend a, uh, $1, 20 cents in variable manufacturing overhead costs for every bike that we produce. Questions? <clears throat> For the fixed manufacturing overhead, it's the same thing. There's still four steps. We still do the first three steps before the uh, period begins. Step one is estimating the total fixed overhead cost. Step two is selecting a allocation base and then estimating what the total amount to be for that period. And keep in mind, um, you, you can use the same um, uh, allocation base 
or you can use a different allocation base. There's nothing saying that you have to use the same base between your variable and your fixed. The third one is that you're going to calculate your predetermined fixed manufacturing overhead rate by dividing this number, your total manufacturing fixed overhead cost, by your estimated allocation or your estimated uh, allocation base, your cost driver. And then step four, same thing. We're just talking about fixed cost versus variable cost. Um, as the, the period begins and you start producing product, every time that you have a machine hour or a direct labor hour or a direct labor dollar, you allocate a portion to that specific job based on that fixed, the predetermined fixed manufacturing overhead rate. So here's what this would look like in uh, good old Charlie's case. Um, here, they're, they're estimating the total fixed manufacturing overhead cost to be $94,080. The, <clears throat> excuse me. The estimated allocation base, we're still going to use direct labor hours, right? And so it'd be the same, 67,200 direct labor hours. And so if we take the 94,080 divided by 67,200, we get $1 and 40 cents for every direct labor hour. And uh, since we have four hours, we're estimating that we'll spend four hours on every bicycle and tricycle, our estimate is we're going to allocate five dollars and sixty cents, a dollar forty times four, five dollars and sixty cents, sixty cents to every bicycle and every tricycle that we make. Questions? Oh. Can you go back to the other side real quick? Because you said they were the same. Could you use both um, for this? Yeah, the first set with the one that we just learned about the allocated manufacturing over. We can use the same ones. I'm sorry? Yes, you can use the same. So here we use, we're using uh, our allocation bases, direct labor hours but you don't necessarily, you don't have to use the same. Okay. I just didn't know if there was like a dramatic difference between the two. Okay. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna break, put you guys into some breakout rooms. We have, uh, a lot of people here. So let's create uh, 10 rooms, get four people per room. <clears throat> Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet because you don't even know what you're going to do. Uh, this is what you're going to do. S11-11 in your books, it's going to have you um, allocating out uh, or calculating the predetermined manufacturing overhead rate for fixed and for variable. And according to the publisher, this should take you five minutes. You may join your room now.
Thank you for sharing that. So let's move forward <clears throat> with now talking about the variable overhead variance. Now, here's the good news. This works very similar to how the uh, direct labor variance looked. Okay. What we're looking at is how much of this difference between our flexible budget and actual, how much of that difference is related to uh, the rate that we chose um, or the rate being different than what we expected? And how much is it related to our efficiency, our ability to produce as many units as we said we would produce uh, within a certain amount of hours? Okay. So um, to calculate the variable overhead rate, you take the actual hours and you multiply that by the difference between the standard uh, predetermined variable overhead rate and the actual predetermined variable overhead rate. To get the efficiency variance, we take the standard predetermined variable overhead rate and we multiply that by the difference between our estimated, and I'll put that in quotation, hours, right? Because it could be direct labor dollars or it could be machine hours or labor hours um, and our actual hours. Okay? What we estimated our cost driver to be versus what our actual cost driver was in terms of uh, quantity. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide unless someone wants me to hold here. Tony, was that a hold or was that keep going? It was a hold. Keep too. going. Oh, hold, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. We're good, thank you. All right. <clears throat> so let's see what this looks like with Charlie Cycles. So let's say that we uh, are budgeted units to produce. Where's my, uh, let's see if we can't switch over to this thing here. Okay, so we budgeted 1,000 by six, 369 sickles. Our actual units were 950 bicycles, but we actually produced 375 tricycles, uh, and our cost um, was $1,691, and we actually used 5,830 hours. Okay. So I wonder if, let me see if I can switch over to my iPad so we can do some drawing. I probably should have pulled this up first. All right. And here we are. So remember there's four hours, right? This is 1,369 times four hours for every bicycle and tricycle. So we were budgeted to spend 5,476 uh, hours, right? And at three cents per hour, our, okay. 
All right, thank you. Our variable manufacturing overhead rate would be, I mean, our variable manufacturing overhead total would be $1,642.80. And Is the 37 actually, previous, like backwards? Is that where it came from? Yes. Oh, it just popped. <laughs> Never yeah. Mind. So this is this is direct labor. This is direct labor. Total direct labor hours and 30 cents per hour. So that's what we budgeted our variable manufacturing overhead rate to be. But we want to look at the flexible budget, right? This is the master. We want to look at the flexible budget. The flexible budget, we actually had $1,325. And again, we're budgeting for direct labor hours. So based off of this, we would have expected to spend $5,000 300 hours okay. and we would have expected it to be our variable manufacturing overhead to be 1,590. But our costs were actually 1,691 okay. and our direct labor hours were actually 5,830. So the variance here, the difference between the 1691 and the 1590 is that 101. And Julian, is that favorable or unfavorable? That our budget favorable. calls for one, it's unfavorable. Our budget called for 1,590, but we actually spent 1,691. <clears throat> so what we can do, is we can look at how much of that is related to the rate, that we chose, how much is, re is it related to the efficiency? Okay. And our, our, we have 101 unfavorable, right? So for the rate, it was the actual hours times the difference between the standard EV, OH, and the actual PVOH, sorry. Okay. So our actual hours are 5,830 this number here. So here, actual hours, 5,830. We take that by the difference between our standard PV uh, predetermined variable overhead rate, which was 30 cents, which comes from here. And then we have to calculate what was our actual variable overhead rate. Okay. In other words, we spent $1,691 over 5,830 hours. So if we do that math, our actual
rate was 29 cents per direct labor hour. Just to be clear, that's not supposed to be negative 5,000, right? It's supposed to be just regular 5,000 under direct labor hour? Yes. Yes. That's a dash, not a negative. In accounting, when we say negatives, we use uh, parentheses. Right. But you also can't have negative 5,830 hours. Um, so that actual goes here, okay? So five, eight, three, zero times point times a penny okay, is $58. Okay? And this would be favorable because what it cost us, 29 cents, is less than what we thought it would cost us per hour, 30 cents. Do we always have to round it or does it matter? Does it matter? Uh, round. I got 58. Round what? Uh, 5,830 times one penny. $58. Oh, you got $58.30. Yeah. <laughs> does yeah. it matter? doesn't matter huh? well Jen, Jenny it may matter uh, on my accounting lab so if they tell you to round to two decimal places round to two, two decimal places um, yeah all right let's look at the efficiency which the efficiency formula is down here, standard PVOH times the difference between estimated hours and actual hours. Okay, so here the estimated hours, I mean, our standard PVOH was 30 cents. Okay. Um, our estimated hours coming back here. Sure, that didn't go away, but that was 1325 times four, 5,300. So our estimated hours are 5,300. But our actual hours were right here, 5,830. So that would be uh, 30 cents times a negative. Julian, I know I just said that we always use parentheses, but I'm not going to use parentheses right now. 530. And 30 cents times a negative 530 gives a negative 159. And this would be unfavorable. And, um, well, let me pause for a second, let you finish wrapping your head around the, the numbers. Once we use the, the uh, master budget total hours, we don't really need to ever go back once we figure out what our actual is, right? I think that's where I'm confused is when I keep using the budgeted hours instead of the flexible budget hours when I'm figuring out the uh, equation. So once we kind of have our actual hours and we just kind of ignore the budgeted, budgeted one in, the, in uh, these scenarios? We avoid the master budget. 
once we have the flexible budget. Okay. So we just ignore yeah. that. Okay. That's where I keep getting confused because I keep wanting to take the master budget and the actual um, mm -hmm. hours. Got it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So let me tell you why it's unfavorable. Okay. Number one, math, right? 58 plus 58 minus 159 equals a negative 101, which is unfavorable. But here's why it's unfavorable. You don't want it to say math if you're an accountant. Um, we thought to make 1,325 bikes, we assumed that that would take us 5,300 hours. But it actually took us 5,830 hours more hours than what we had anticipated. That's what makes this unfavorable okay? because we weren't as efficient as we were less efficient than we expected. Questions? So I know we used the negative 530. Um, um, like and like the answer I got from the calculator was negative one fifty nine, but in this case it would just be we just leave it as positive. Well, that negative one fifty nine tells you it's not good. Oh. It's unfavorable. Okay. I mean, would we have to like yeah input it into the budget in a negative way? Um, not for this class. I was in a breakout room on uh, Monday and I was talking to someone about using negatives and positives, favorable versus unfavorable. Uh, and I think if you're working at a company, we all start speaking the same language. And so we know negative means unfavorable, positive means favorable. Okay. Um, but we're not going to get to that level of familiarity in this class. So we're just going to use absolute numbers and explicitly call it out as a favorable or an unfavorable variant. Other questions? Can I encourage you all to practice S11-8? So you all can Dive Are back you into that? your break, okay. breakout rooms. Breakout rooms. And work on S11 8. This should take you, I'm told, 10 minutes per the publisher. Oh, I have to open the rooms. Rooms are open. And looks like Jalen and Suki. You guys must have got uh, logged off. So remind me what rooms you're in, and I'll move you. Uh, I'm in four. That was Suki? Yes, sir. Got you. And Jalen? Got it. So uh, Gurjeet and Eddie, um, you all can go to your uh, breakout rooms.
So, uh, Thomas, I moved you to uh, six. Thank you. And Gurjeet and Eddie. Wow. Sofa in your room? It's not a room. It's my uh, workspace. <laughs> oh, wow. You have like two rooms, like, a, like, a, like an office. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. And then, um, so we needed to find the variance rate or the, the VOH rate variance. And to find that, we needed the uh, actual hours, the standard VOH and the actual PVOH. So listed in here in the problem, it has the actual hours, which is 1,170 right here. And then the list, the standard uh, PVOH, which is right here, 24, the standard right here, v, uh, variable manufacturing overhead rate, 24. And then the actual rate of last month was 22. So then they calculated it, you got um, the one seven or the 1,170 times the 24 minus two, which comes out to 2,340, which is favorable because the standard rate or which was less than the standard rate. Um, and then for the next one, you got the variable overhead uh, efficiency variance. And that one, you need the standard PVOA, which we already got for the last problem. And then you need estimate hours and actual hours. The actual hours are given to you, which we had in the last problem, but the estimated hours, you need to calculate by using the results from last month, which is 4,000 tables last month. And then you multiply it by the 0.3 hours table. And then that gets you the estimated amount of hours it would take for next month, um, which is 12,000. And then to calculate the variance, you got um, the standard rate minus the actual hours or the estimated hours minus the actual hours times this. And then you get 720. And since the since the uh, actual hours was less than the estimated hours, the result is positive and favorable. That's the answers. Tom, so you're gonna have to show me how to do a split screen, um, but we'll save that for. You just uh, so easy though. It's doing a split screen is so you simple. Just, just toss it. The, like you grab the window. Yeah. You grab the window and you. Just, oh, it doesn't work because I have actually I have two strings going. That has to go on this side. So I grab here. And then I just tossed it. Oh, oh, it's not going. I just toss it on the side and I can click whichever one I want. And that's the one I want. See, I got two. On Windows. I don't know if that works on Mac because I've tried that. Yeah, if you have a Mac, it won't work, I don't think. It's something different. <laughs> so there's the answer. I agree, Thomas. All right. Technology aside, uh, are there questions about that? How we got, how, uh, Thomas got those numbers. Yeah. What is this information? And team. Uh, what is this information used for? Like, with why is this like important to figure out this um, information? The like figuring out the variable overhead rate variance and the efficiency variance. So you know there's a difference between <clears throat> what you budgeted and what you actually spent, but the question becomes. How much of that difference is because of the, um, your efficiency, right? Where we use more or less hours than what we anticipated. Because that's the conversation we want to go have with our floor manager, the shop manager, and say, hey, we didn't anticipate using this many hours. What can we do to bring it down? Um, or what did you do well that allowed us to use less hours than we anticipated? With the rate, that's the information you want to take over to the finance team, the budgeting team, and say, this rate that we're using is, is not holding true month to month, right? So maybe we need to adjust our rate so that we, can, we don't have as many surprises from a budgeting perspective. So that's why we're taking this difference and wanting to bifurcate it or separate it out between how much of it is related to the rate, how much of it is related to our efficiency. Um, awesome, thank you. I had a question. Um, 
Thomas, would you mind pulling up your screen again? Because I wanted to ask you about like how you how you got a certain one, but I've got them. Thank you. Um, so just so with the uh, BOH rate variance, that was you ended up doing one thousand one seventy times twenty four minus oh twenty four minus two. Mm. Okay. And then you had to find the estimated hours first before calculating the efficiency variance. Yeah. And then that one was four thousand times three because you're it doesn't it doesn't like give you some the actual estimated might not have been four thousand but we don't have that list in the question but we do have what they got last month and so they're probably expecting a same amount or same results so they're probably expecting they're estimating four thousand tables for this upcoming month okay. so you just multiply that times it takes 0.3 hours to to make one table so you multiply that to get the hours it would take to make four thousand tables okay cool and then so then that would just be then it would be the 0.30 times 1200 minus the actual oh, so 1170 right so point thirty times the 4000 minus the 1170 times the 24 yeah okay I'm a little shaky on it but I'll, I'll I'll dig more into it okay just the last part is this usually Chapter professor for our students. The this one. I'm sorry. Is this chapter more challenging for students usually? And since you've been teaching it multiple times, is that one of the harder ones? Uh, no, I wouldn't say this is a more challenging chapter. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get most of it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> But we have office hours. You can always schedule an office hour, come in with your questions, and I think I can help you get it. I know I can help you get it. If I can't, then I can't do my job. All right, so um, let's talk about this last one here, the fixed overhead variance. Now, uh, with the fixed overhead variance, this doesn't work like the other one. Okay? So we're not taking this budget variance and adding it to the volume variance, okay? We don't do adding here, okay? They're telling us two separate things. So um, to get the budget variance, we take our budgeted costs and we subtract our actual costs. And to get the volume variance, we take our standard hours, how many hours we expect it to use, right, or whatever our driver is, times our predetermined fixed overhead rate, okay, and then we subtract that from our budgeted cost. Okay. This would tell us our volume variance. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So I'll show you an example um, with Charlie Cycles. Okay. So the budget was for 1,369 bicycles and tricycles, right? 1,000 bicycles, 369 tricycles. Each one we estimated would take four hours. Um, so that was 5,476. And then we multiplied that by our predetermined manufacturing fixed overhead rate of $1.40. And that gives us 
76, 7,666. And 40 cents, but I'm just going to stop at the dollars. Okay. So here's what I want you guys to, to pick up on. Because this is where, this is always where people get, students get confused. Okay. This is a fixed cost. So when I move this over here and say, okay, well, for my, if I do my flexible budget, okay, which is based off of volume, okay, even though my volume changes, my fixed cost should not change. Okay. So I don't have to go in and do a times four and times a dollar forty based off of this because my fixed costs should stay the same because they're not tied to the volume. Just want that to sink in for a little bit. Kerplunk, it's sunk. All right, so to figure out my budget variant, I'm going to take the difference between my budget minus actual. Okay. So my budget at fixed costs were what well, keeps going away, but it was 7,666, right? Same thing. Okay. And then my actual was 7,400. So I take 7,666 minus my actual. So this gives me a difference of $266. And is that favorable or unfavorable? Unfavorable? Favorable? I think it's favorable because I expected to spend 766, but I actually spent 7,400. <clears throat> now that's it. Other thing that we look at is our fixed overhead volume variance. Okay. And that, to get that, we take the standard hours, how many hours we expected to spend, times our predetermined fixed overhead rate, minus our budget. Budget costs, budget fixed costs. Okay. So to figure out our standard hours, uh, we take the uh, thirteen twenty-five, right, and this is the actual units we produced, okay, and we multiply that by four, right, and so that tells us uh, 5,300, and then we multiply that by $1.40, because that was our direct, uh, our fixed, our predetermined fixed overhead rate uh, per direct labor hour. And that gives us a total of 7,420. And then we subtract that from our budgeted fixed costs of 7,666. 
and that equals two hundred and forty six dollars, which would be unfavorable. Uh, I expect someone to ask me a question. Um, so and the, why is it unfavorable? Because oh, well, it's negative. Yeah. Yeah. So two reasons why it's unfavorable. One, but it's just weird because. because like, go ahead. Oh no! I just said it's just kind of weird because like. It's less than the budgeted, so I would think it'd be favorable. That's all. Yeah, so um, here's why this is unfavorable. Okay. And what this volume, well, here's what the volume variance is telling us. Okay. They're saying this is unfavorable because they said, man, we could have done more. We expect it to do more with this cost. We expect it there to be 13,069 bicycles and tricycles produced, but we only produce 1325. Um, so that's why it's unfavorable because they didn't take advantage of all the space they have. Let me give you another uh, example. Okay. Let's say I'm going to rent a um, I'm gonna rent a, a room to have a conference in. This is pre-COVID-19, y'all. It's pre-COVID-19. Um, and they're gonna charge me $500 to rent the room. Okay. That would be considered a fixed cost. Okay. Let's say I plan on having 50 people in the room. Okay. So my fixed, uh, <clears throat> my predetermined fixed overhead rate per person is going to be ten dollars ten dollars per person is that making sense five hundred dollars to rent this room i expect 50 people to show up so it's going to be ten dollars per person okay. what if only 40 people show up okay. that means I didn't fully take advantage of the space that I had. Does that make sense? So when I'm doing this allocation, I would, I would take $10 per person times 40 people. I would have only allocated $400 to my fixed cost. Even though my fixed cost were $500. That would be unfavorable okay. because I didn't take full advantage of the space that I had. So what now if look you at go like really over? Yeah. So what if I had 60 people show up, right? Well, we all know that's good, right? Because now I got more people than I anticipated. So I can take that $500 that cost and spread it out over, um, I could spread it out over more individuals, right? But I'm still stuck with this, right? So 10 times, I'll do it up here. I'll do it over here. $10 times 60 means my budgeted fixed cost or what I would have allocated would have been 600, okay? Right here, 600. But my budget at fixed costs were only 500. Okay. So that's a positive $100. That's good because I actually was more efficient with the space than I planned to be. Questions? Um, the 1,325 um, was 
is that a combination or so, no sorry is that considered to be the standard hours no that was the number of bicycles and tricycles mm -hmm. if you go back to you have to go back to here 950 bicycles 375 tricycles that's 1325 oh i see uh, I have a question about 60 people. So if you have yeah. more people working, so you have to pay more, right? And then the fixed cost is higher. So why is favorable? No, this is so this isn't more people working, right? Um, fixed costs are $500. And if I think I can produce 50, or if I think you know, if the room cost me $500 and I think I can get 50 people in that room, then it's going to cost me $10 per person. Okay. Right? A fixed cost. So when I'm thinking about my profitability, I'm thinking of my fixed cost of $10 per person plus the $20 for variable cost for materials, right? So that's 30 bucks. I want to charge them about 45 bucks to come to this session, okay. right? So I can figure out my profitability. But what we're saying, oh, I'm sorry, pause. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So, what, but what we're saying is, well, what if 60 people showed up, right? Well, it's still gonna cost me, what did I say, $15 for the variable cost, but now I'm taking that, that $500 and instead of allocating it to 50 people, I'm actually allocating it to 60 people, oh. which means my fixed cost per person is lower, which is a good thing. Okay, so it's mean the fixed cost not change even the people are, get more people. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Now, let me say one more thing, right, about fixed costs. So with fixed costs, there's a limit, right? Maybe I can get 60 people, but I can't get 80 people in that room, right? Because the room's only so big. It can only hold 65 people or 60 people. So if I were to have 80 people, then I'd have to double the space. Maybe now I'm paying uh, $1,000 to rent the room, right? So remember, fixed cost is always within a, a relevant range. <clears throat> Questions? So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be that guy. Um, there was one more problem that, that uh, you all should work, that you're supposed to work on, but I'm going to trust that you all are going to take a look at S11-9 on your own. And then if it doesn't make sense to you, I'm gonna trust that you're gonna email someone in the class and say, let's get together and understand this. Or let's get together and schedule a meeting with uh, Eric so that we can understand it. And shout out to the boxer. By the way, the, uh, I hate to keep teasing this story up, but uh, the dog that my cousins, my two cousins murdered was a boxer. Yeah. So I'm, have quite an effect. My, he was a brindle, didn't have any white. It was all brindle. Beautiful, beautiful puppy. Um, I'll show you guys a picture. I have a picture of him somewhere. Uh, I'll find it. In, in a frame. I have a picture of him in a frame. So your cousin murdered your dog? Yes, my two cousins murdered my dog. You go to jail because they should. He murdered no, they your did dog. Not. No, they did not go to jail. Well, okay, murder is the wrong word. Let's call it, uh, they would want to say involuntary manslaughter. I'm going to go with manslaughter. Well, it's not really a man, it's a dog slaughter. They, they killed my dog, but it wasn't like, um, they didn't do it with intent to kill, but they killed him. How, how did they kill him? Uh, you know, it's a story, man. In a nutshell, <laughs> do we they run want him over? Let him go so, on the freeway. What happened? 
so this is probably like, I don't know, it's got to be at least it's more than 10 years. It's about like 12, 15 years. Um, I was going, we were going out of town and I asked my cousin, I think I asked one of my cousins or maybe both of them to house sit for me. No, I asked him to take care of my dog. And then I said that you all can house sit because, you know, you're taking care of my dog. Right. So they wanted to hang out at the house. They were, you know, in their twenties. Um, and so they're at the house. I have my dog in the backyard. They felt like I was mistreating the dog and they're like, we got to let Chewy out, let him run around. And Chewy left the, um, left the gate. So these guys, uh, uh, these guys uh, went and, and lost my dog. So this is separate, this is separate from the napping story. So they lost my, they, they, they couldn't find the dog. He left the, the gate, they left the gate open. So he ran out the gate and they couldn't find him. So their response was, hey, you know, so last night at the house, we should still invite some friends over and smoke weed and get drunk. Um, I guess that's what 20 year olds do. So that's what they did. And the next morning when they woke up, they came and he walked outside and he saw that Chewy uh, came back. But when Chewy came back, he there was coolant, like uh, coolant for a car that was sitting on the patio. And Chewy was messing around with the coolant and had ingested the coolant and he poisoned himself and he died laying on the porch. And they left and put a tarp over him and they're like, I think we should leave. And they left. You left your dead dog. Yeah. How long was it until you came back? I was coming back. That I came back that same day. They found him in the morning. I came back. Oh, geez. So, uh, do you still talk yeah. to your to your brothers after this? Cousins. To my cousin. Yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> what? The fa family. <laughs> Did you yeah. press charges? Against my family? Hey, don't have <laughs> no. them babysit your kids. Just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's I'm a actually the godfather to what? Uh, I'm the godfather to one of my cousin's kids now. I'm, I'm the godfather to his, 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 uh, his kid. Here's the thing the, one of the cousins, so one of them is a, uh, he's a comedian and he lives in, uh, lives in uh, Dallas. Um, he, had a, he wrote a joke that was hilarious that was on, uh, I think, Jay Leno's show or Dave Letterman's. They, they called him out. The, my other cousin uh, actually used to work at Las Casitas as a counselor. Uh, and now he works, uh, he's working on his PhD at, uh, and he's a counselor at uh, DVC. But yeah, every time I see him, I, I you know, call him out as a, uh, as a murderer. Oh my God. <laughs> That's what I, mean, I see him as. Yeah. So class is over, right? Uh, yeah, not unless there's any other questions about, you know, poor Chewy. Are we going to turn in this, uh, this last problem? Or are you going to want to see it? No, I'm going to trust that you all are going to do it. Is this, question. is this the last chap, um, class for Chapter 11? Are we going to be going over finals uh, information next week? We have one more class of Chapter 11. Okay. Um, as far as I could see. Okay. So I, I need to sit down and think about next week and the next two weeks. But we are rounding this thing out. Um, do we have a flip grid tonight? No, no, we do not. Okay, perfect, perfect. Whew. All right, and that's class. So uh, thank you all for indulging me with the uh, Chewy story. I'll go find the pictures, Chewy. Uh, How long ago was it? Oh, this is at least 15 years ago. Oh. <laughs> well, he's still, you know, I'm my one and only pet. So. Professor, is the data test still the same one on the syllabus? That's the plan, yes. Okay. All right. Good night. Bye, Professor. Have a good night.